welcome to the last step with me and my good friend Frank, who is back in the south of France joining us. And uh, yeah, so uh, so I woke up this morning after last week's show. I came off the set, and I usually go to we have this master shows document that we go on to, and I write an intention for the next week. I'll write something that feels present or will be, and then I see what comes in that supports that, or you know that we can talk about. So last week I actually went onto that screen and I wrote uh, the fear and sexual inventory, which in the twelve step program I was in, which all twelve step programs I believe, you go through the fourth step, which we talked about on one of the shows, the resentment inventory. And then there's three basic ones that we go through: the resentment inventory, which I shared the whole spreadsheet and how that worked. Then you have a fears inventory and a sexual inventory. And I wrote it down and I was like, huh, you know, what's going to come in about that? And I have a friend I'm working with in Mexico, actually, that was going through the process and they're at that point. And I had wanted to join with them. I'm like, is that the reason, the only reason I'm doing this so that they can get an understanding of the process I went through and what the, uh, the 12 step book, which we use the, I use the big book tells us how that process works. And so then throughout the week, not much came in and I actually changed my topic in the, uh, in the sheet. And then, this morning I woke up with nothing on my mind and I went into, you know, a meditation early in the morning and it's like, all right, what would you have me talk about today? Like, what is it? Make it obvious. And Susanna sent me a message. Can we join? She's usually not up that early. So I went back and we, we sat together and, you know, being in this marriage, we, we look at a lot of our thoughts and certainly around this topic as well. And we sat and she shared pretty much we did a fifth step. She shared everything that she had gone through or seemed to go through. And it was quite, it was quite awesome. I've been through a lot of with sponsees, had them share fifth steps, but never something so, so personal, I guess, in that aspect. And yeah, it was amazing. And I asked, you know, have you ever told anyone all that? And she was like, no. And it's like, that's what this process of, you know, 12 step recovery allows us to do because there's so much shame tied up in sex. It's like, it's unavoidable. It's like, we can say that we think that we don't feel guilty or we do or whatever it is, but we don't ever fully realize how, how much of an effect it has on us because from a young age, I was raised Catholic and all this, there's so much taboo around it. And just even the roles, I mean, a guy that has a lot of sex is a stud and a girl who does, she's a whore. And those things are like literally reinforced everywhere we look in media and everywhere. So it becomes part of, you know, this mindset that we have. And it was funny. So when I went through the steps and I got to this point, my life was seemingly not very promiscuous or, I didn't cheat on my girlfriends or any of that. So when I got to this point in the book, like the resentments, I went crazy with that, you know, notebooks full of stuff. And I got to this and I nearly skipped over it. <clears throat> I was like, I don't think I need to do that. I didn't have that much sexual because they, on some levels, they call it sexual misconduct. It's like, well, no, mine, there wasn't misconduct or whatever. And I sat and I, so I've been through it a few times now, but it was more, it's not about, either have having sex or not having or how much or any of it. It's actually about the patterns and what the motives are behind it. And I'm gonna actually read a few of uh, a few of the paragraphs from the big book. Like I said, uh, the 12 step program that I was in, I used the, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous as my, my text really. And <clears throat> I'll read a few of the paragraphs and actually talk about some of the stuff and my experience with it and how amazing it was. And it's no doubt it actually, the sexual, sexual inventory ends up on page 69. So Jesus has a sense of humor for sure. And <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's amazing how short certain steps are in this book that are transforming, you know, because I never looked at any of these things, you know, and even when I sat down with the sponsor and actually went through what I'm going to share with you. And this one I did a little bit differently. I've done it with the whole charts. And if you go online and look stuff up, you can find the spreadsheets like I shared for resentments and, or you can actually just write it out, which is the way I'm going to, the big book actually explains it. So I'm going to read it to you. So it says, now about sex, many of us needed an overhauling there. That was the line that I read. I'm like, I don't need an overhauling. Like I was pretty, 
I was pretty good. And even that, it's like this idea that the comparisons that Nicholas, and this was funny too, they, this morning I said something to Andy, he's like, that's what my show's about. Like it's in the mind, like this idea of sex or whatever. And even that, this comparison, like, oh, I wasn't that bad or I didn't do that much or whatever it was, was the problem for me, like thinking that. But if you took my life in comparison to some of my friends, like I had friends that were with one person their whole life, like they married their, their wife and that was the only person they were with. So in comparison to that, I was very sexually active. But then in comparison to some of my other friends, I was a saint. It was like, so the mind just keeps trying to make it. I don't need to look at it. This is all it was trying to do to me. So that line kind of uh, deterred me from really looking into it at first. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. And what I love about this line, it says this question. It doesn't even talk about there's a question. It's like my rules for decision. I have no question. I forgot what to decide. What's the question? Do I have sex or do I not have sex? <laughs> That's literally what they're talking about here. It's so easy to get way off track. And don't we know that? Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of the lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school of thought would allow a man no flavor for his fare, where the other would have us on a straight pepper diet, which means none at all. <laughs> we want to stay out of this controversy. And that's what the 12-step programs in recovery try to do, is they stay out of any type of controversy, because what I just said, it's not actually about, even if you're having it or not having it or whatever it is, it's about the judgments that go along with it. And really, ultimately, what this step does is showed me the patterns that I was using as defenses, protections, whatever it was that was in my mind that I had to look at everything in order to see it so that I could transform that and move beyond it because a problem cannot be solved until it is seen. We know that, so that's what this step actually does for us. <clears throat> then it says here, yeah, we do not want to be the arbiter, the judge of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? So this next paragraph is actually six, literally six sentences, and this is the assignment. You know, me and Frank always talk about assignments, and even with everyone I talk about, talk to, I actually have this next paragraph that I'll have Marie can put into the chat, so you guys can see these are the questions I took every relationship that I ever had or was in, and I wrote down their names: Jennifer, Bethany, all of it, and I wrote them all down on a list. And then I asked each one of these questions and answered them as honestly as I could. So this paragraph, if you actually do this, this could change your life. It literally could. We reviewed our conduct over the past years. So that's what I just said. I took every person's name that I'd ever been sexually active with, and I put them on a list. And then I asked these questions. Where had I been selfish? And it says them in order, but I ask each question individually. And I think about in that relationship, where had I been selfish? You know, what did it look like? And it looks different for each thing. It might be holding back money so that they do certain things for me or pay, you know, different, different aspects like play into it. And actually the step book talks about instant instincts in collision because it's a whole nother way to do it. But what we're talking about here is just asking me these questions of each one of these, these relationships. Where had I been dishonest? Where had I lied just about anything? Where had I been inconsiderate? And then whom had I hurt? And this was one that I had to look at really deeply because there was a belief I didn't hurt certain people. But the next question is what really, really opened me up to, oh my God, I do need to do this. I need to look at these patterns because the next question is, did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? And I took each one individually too. Did I unjustifiably allow, arouse jealousy? And then think of that relationship and think of the instance because this is a specific set. The ego wants to be vague, but when we actually go into these specifics, we can look at it and say, oh my God, I remember that time with Jennifer or whatever, where I danced with the other person or brought them home or whatever it was specifically <laughs> because it was what I wanted to do. It was like this deep selfishness or you know jealousy. 
where did I arouse suspicion, you know, not being fully honest in things? And where did I arouse bitterness? And then the next question is, where was I at fault and what have I should do done instead? And this is just a question of actually looking, because we believe, there's a certain part of the mind, believe that we did things wrong. We can sit there and ghost over and say, yeah, you never do anything wrong. There's no right or wrong. But in my mind, I believe it certainly in this department, because it is such an intimate, literally intimate experience being with someone else that these things tend to lay a pattern in the mind that is becomes who we who we are and this is a big huge thing for addicts and alcoholics because a lot of people black out and they don't remember the things they've done or anything that has happened and then that even causes for more shame even not knowing what we've done or anything and this is the line right here so after that where had we been at fault what should have i done instead we got this all down on paper and looked at it so many people read this and say oh yeah i did the step i I addressed it, but there's something so powerful about writing stuff down on a piece of paper. And then of course, in the next step, which is the fifth step, which was kind of what happened this morning, this just really letting up all these shameful or belief that they're shameful things, really letting them up is what ha happens with this release. So then this next paragraph, so that's the paragraph that I had Marie share with you that I did with each relationship. And I've done this a few times to see the patterns that I was in. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. It's just we're trying to better ourselves in this. We subjected each relationship to this test. Was it selfish or not? And for most of my relationships, I could see the point when I looked at my patterns. I saw it was after a broken heart, like when we had this huge, everything after that was selfish. Every relationship was identical, actually. When I looked at the patterns, they were identical. They were the same type of people. It was like I was holding them. I never actually planned on being with them forever. There was never a commitment. It was always about something physical or something else, depending on what relationship it was. This next one is where it's beautiful because every time in this book, it says we asked. And ask is prayer. And when you see that, this book is actually so similar to, to The Course of Miracles, where all this is trying to do is get us in touch with the internal guide to have him make the decisions for me on everything, including this. Like, we ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. We remembered always that our, power, our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised and loathed. And this, of course, isn't the way it's written is more, you know, not metaphysically correct with what we study in the course. But all this is saying is that spirit can use anything. That's all it's saying that spirit can use anything. And that's even in my relationship in my marriage, we pray deeply on, you know, what, what would you have us do in any situation so that there's not anything coming from a point of anger or a point of whatever it is, we can actually stay in that place. Whatever the, our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow towards it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm. This is part of the process. We have the ninth step where we make amends, provided that we do not bring harm to others. In other words, this is, a, this is great. We treat sex as we would any other problem. This takes it away that there's no degree of miracles or no difficulty. You know, we can't look at everything like sex is over here and then everything else is over here. It literally says we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do with each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. Like this is the willingness in this thing about asking, even about those in such a difficult area to hand over. I remember talking to sponsees and saying he married with his wife and he had this and that. I go, you got to pray. You got to bring the Holy Spirit into the bedroom. And he's like, excuse me? <laughs> like we, we have this protection over this part of our mind where it's like, not there, you know, many, it's money in this, and this is certainly another one, like, well, what would he have me do? Or maybe I'm not supposed to have any of it. You know, all these judgments come from that wrong side of the mind where this is actually spirit knows where our happiness lies. And if we can actually follow, that's going to bring us into the expansion of the mind. So I love that part. And then, you know, the next paragraph, God alone can judge. God doesn't judge. We know that. But it's literally that we don't judge. We don't judge our sex situation, anything we have done or that we're going to do. This is letting go of that decision maker. So I do want to share this other little paragraph because it's the uh, 
it's like the culmination of this page. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, what would you have me do? For the guidance in each questionable situation, for what? For sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. Now they use the thing, the right thing, but it's really what you would have me do. That's all we're doing and it's like, if sex is very troublesome, which it is for a lot of people, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. Like NA or, you know, NA, AA, Sex Anonymous, all these different 12 step programs, it's always the answer. What would you have me do? Just throw into service. Once we're in service, our mind goes away from it and we can't even think about it anymore. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. This is what, you know, Nicholas and Andy were talking about this morning with not knowing uh, pain from pleasure and that imperious urge when we do yield to it. We don't understand that it is heartache behind it, <laughs> but there's this temptation to actually follow it. So all this section is saying is like that part about writing this stuff out. When you write it out, you'll be amazed, or I was amazed rather. I was amazed when I wrote that stuff down and saw the patterns that even I had when I thought I didn't really have much to look at in it because I had people that I did fifth steps with. I had a fifth step friend that was in prison for sexual misconduct for certain things. And when those things are shared, it's like you, you, you tend to see your own things a lot differently. But when I had those experiences, it showed me that I really can't be the arbiter of anyone's, you know, the judge of anyone's sexual misconduct. I had another friend that shared, you know, these shameful things of one of the first things a sponsor will ask you in a fifth step is sometimes it's the first thing. Well, before you have your whole list of everything and they walk up and it's like, okay, put that aside. What's the one thing you didn't put on there? <laughs> What's the one thing that you want to take to your grave? I even asked Susanna that this morning after she shared a bunch of stuff. I said, listen, is there anything that you don't want to share with someone. Those are the things. That's where, that's where the ego hides in this idea. It loses power once we say it. It doesn't have this power anymore. And this friend that was sharing something with me shared about something that he thought was so shameful and, you know, involved the sexual act that was so, you know, depraved or whatever. And when he shared it with me, I laughed and we sat there and, you know, I shared a few things. And about 10 minutes later, I recalled that two years ago, he had told me that already. And I told him, I said, I said, dude, I remember two years ago, you told me that. And he's like, oh yeah. And I go, I had forgotten. Like it was that unimportant. <laughs> like this stuff is only important to us. Like we keep it to ourselves and we keep those, the, it keeps the power by keeping it to ourselves. So yeah, so I have a ton of stories around, you know, around fifth steps with people and you know, doing this process myself, but I do want to see what Frank, I talked to Frank this morning and uh, I called him and I didn't have this in mind. And I called him and I says, uh, I said, Frank, I said, Frank, Frank, I'm thinking we're going to talk about uh, the sexual inventory and that. And he's like, Oh, I got nothing to say about that. <laughs> I said, sure you do Frank. So yeah. So this is just this morning. I brought it up with Frank and he's had his own journey with this. So I thought maybe he could share some of it. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny that the ego doesn't want me to talk about that because I woke up with a sore throat. I said, oh, I can't talk. Well, I have the hiccups. You know? <laughs> it's kind of like the, the resistance. But, you know, when I, um, yeah, when I, I did my inventory, I saw a big, a, a, a big pattern, you know, and, um, and a lot of my life, you know, and surrounding was about, you know, getting, you know, drugs, sex, rock and roll, you know, the whole thing. And, and it was just always, you know, the main thing was um, to get it no matter what and no matter who gets hurt. And then also uh, one of the main um, ma main uh, reasons was not so much, you know, anything that feels good, it's I get addicted to, you know, but also... Um, it was, you know, one of the things that, that felt good was the approval. So it was like chasing, constantly chasing for approval. And, uh, you know, it was hard when I was, uh, when I got, um, you know, when, when I came into 12 steps because I had to begin changing my, my, uh, 
behavior and I did, also didn't have the substance, you know, to, and so I realized so much of my self-esteem had to do with, you know, the women I was, I was conquering, you know, and, um, and I realize now that, uh, you know, um, also I could, you know, I could never be, when I was with a woman, uh, two days later, if she would tell me, I love you, I'd, ah, you know, that was too much, I would be out of there. So there was, I couldn't even look somebody in the eyes and stuff. And, uh, and interesting enough, that healed, you know, while, while I, because I was married for a long time and I wasn't, you know, um, really, uh, you know, screwing around. But, um, but when the marriage ended, I saw that that was healed, you know, that that was um, when, I, when I then got into a relationship because it was very, um, I mean, my, my marriage at the end was so asexual. But then I saw, wow, you know, just being in conscious contact healed me from that. I can now, I don't have to have, uh, you know, different women all the time. I can, I can be intimate with one woman. And so, so that was a, uh, a big, um, you know, revelation to me that actually I, I did start healing. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, the, it's, it's what do I do to protect the sex, you know? I, I was in, I, I re, you know, the ones who watched last week, I, I just broke up with my girlfriend last week and, um, and uh, you know, that was, so I'm, I'm still really dealing with that, but, uh, you know, I remember two weeks prior to to um, uh, to to breaking up. She asked me, "So, are you going to join this community?" And, um, and I said, "Oh no, no!" I said <laughs> like that because I was because <laughs> I was afraid that she would say, um, "You know, okay, then I'll, I'm out of here." So I was protecting my, you know, I was protecting. The sex, you know, I mean, I was protecting that relationship. Where am I selfish, you know? Am I being totally honest? So, so this is the thing, you know, where am I selfish? Who got hurt, you know? Who gets hurt? And keeping somebody hostage under any uh, pretense that, um, like I said, you know, you know when, when I thought, you know, I might very well be one day totally unavailable. And so, um, a few days later, I, I laid that out on the table. You know, I said uh, I had a, a total uh, tabula rasa about my <laughs> private thoughts, and we decided, you know, and, and we broke up over it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that honesty. You know, what am I... What am I still trying to protect? What am I trying to protect? And, and uh, you know, I had a, that like you, when I saw the sexual inventory at first in, in, in the post up, I thought, you know, it was, I, I, it wasn't deviant or, you know, like, although, you know, there was a lot of manipulation, but it wasn't deviant in that sense. So I don't have too much to say about it. But then, uh, like you say, writing it down, uh, I got deeper into, you know, how, how people got, and it was always about that, that I was just hurting a lot of people because I needed sex, or I thought, from a lot of different girls, you know. And so I was, um, you know, I had this web of manipulation. But, you know, how, how does it affect me today? You know, it's interesting that also, um, a, a few weeks ago, we talked about it on the show that um, I, I I was looking at eventually having a prostate um, operation, and then I'm thinking, now what? You know, now where is all that sexuality? Because you know, a lot of my a lot of my what what I call self esteem, you know, was built up on that. Um, and I know I would have done anything, and I did anything to protect that, you know, my drugs and the women, and, you know, I mean, my, you know, that, that lifestyle. Um, but, you know, like you say, when we talk, we talk uh, often and then uh, every day, 
and we're so used to exposing. You know, it's just part of, it's, it's just part of, of um, it becomes part of, of, of our life, you know, and it has become part of my life uh, since 34 years since I came into, into 12 steps that I have to expose, but now it's like times 10. And mm. so, um, you know, everything that I expose just makes that veil thinner mm. between me and, 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 you know, my, my true holy self. And so, um, you know, there was a time also, I have to say, when I, when I did start with the 12 steps and everything was gone, I was very attracted by, you know, the, the whole prostitution media because it reminded me of the drug scene. And, and mm -hmm. so I was, you know, so I, I got really into that a lot. And, um, you know, but that just from one day to the next, it just stopped. I was, you know, I prayed and it it was, it was really, but it was, like, I was obsessed with this, you know, I was really obsessed. Mm. So that was probably your way around the, uh, there's an idea in the 12 steps that you don't have a relationship for the first year. So it might have been <laughs> well, no, no. That was way around that. What I realized even with coming into the course and even as I, I started looking at this again, you know, this morning and when I see what was really going on, when I actually was pushing this part of the inventory away, thinking I didn't really do things that much. It was always like we had talked about on our original shows. It was on the behavioral level. Like I wasn't one of these guys that would, sleep with a lot of women and talk about it. Like, so it wasn't like to build my ego in that way. But how did I think about it? You know, it's all always, it's not what I'm doing. It's what I think about what I'm doing. So it always did like what you said, that approval or making me feel somehow Andy alluded to, do you feel good for a little while, but something about, you know, you said conquering, but something about just satisfying a woman or just, you know, keeping them, you know, caring for them, whatever it is, becomes such a part of, Oh, who I am or what I am. And that's what happened with my relationship that one. And then after that ended, it was, everyone was at arm's length. So, you know, even discussing now this, like my prayer is to, to reinterpret it all. Like that's part of the show that I want for me is I want to reinterpret the physical act or anything around it to something that's, that's more pure, you know, cause there is a ton of interpretation. I want to try to let go of all those interpretations of it because I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to be in this place that I can hear the guidance, what the book is telling us. You know, I want to be able to ask in specific, say, you know, it said the question, should I or shouldn't I? And it's never about should I or shouldn't I? It's about what I think about, about it, you know? So I actually, I realize now that that's what my prayers and what I saw when I started reading this section this morning, that the first time around, it was just behavioral level. And now it's like, no, I thought about those things. And a lot of people say, I didn't do those things, but sure I thought about it. <laughs> and if my, my mind is where the, the problem is, it's not even judging those thoughts. And that's how I was able to get into this like experience with the guy that shared these thoughts with me or shared what he'd seemed to do to go to prison. It was like, I said, oh, I've had those thoughts or whatever it was. Like I know I had consciously seen they crossed my mind after the experience I had. It was like, when I came back to my world of belief, it was like all these things. I'm like, whoa, where are these beliefs coming from? Like, I never thought about any of these thoughts. And I realized they weren't my thoughts, you know? And so when he shared it with me, I was like, oh, it's like, there was something I was able to hold the space in that, that fifth step. That was really, really profound for me. Yeah. I think also, you know, for me, that the thing that, that bothered me the most is the, the, um, uh, but the lack of honesty, because obviously, you know, with a woman, no, I'm not, no, no, I'm not going to generalize that, but, but it was, I was always trying, <laughs> what I was trying to say, it, sometimes I think, you know, the sexual act means more, you know, than to, to, to you know, to that guy who's a hunter. And, and, and so I willing to sort of, I, or I was, I'm not, I mean, I don't know now, I'm not, uh, to compromise uh, what what I was giving away as a as an information as far as my commitment was concerned or anything you know just just to be you know not to be transparent and and now it's just you know my life is just total transparency since I'm with you guys and so um, you know it's it's uh, it's a totally different um, 
it's a totally different uh, uh, approach and it's a totally, you know, everything is, has to be clear. Like it had to be with Emma last week, you know, this is where I'm at, you know, and this, I don't want to make any other promises other than that. And, um, and I was willing to compromise a lot of that transparency. I mean, there was, you know, for, for, um, uh, for sex. So, yeah. 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 Thanks, Frank. That was, uh, that was great. I don't know where the half hour went, but it's actually <laughs> the time, the time's up. It was like the fastest show I've ever been a part of. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Frank. And yeah, look forward to seeing Go ahead. I was the fastest show for me. <laughs> Wait until it came to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, thanks. I've been hearing from some people in uh, Facebook or Messenger uh, messages. And so if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me or Frank, yeah, feel free to reach out. And me and Frank are going to try to expand the show a little in some way. He's been doing some meditations out there in the south of France. So we're going to try to get those up and all part of this new direction. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And I think. I think we'll see you guys next week. And uh, until then, much love.